Okay, so our first speaker is uh, Weber Andoro. Uh, he's going to talk on heritage or development. What, um, I can't even read my writing, what choices for Africa, I think is what the title says in my ha bad handwriting. I think most of you know Weber, but I will introduce him. He's the uh, director of the African World Heritage Fund and an associate research fe fellow of the University of Cape Town. And he was previously a project manager at ICROM which is where I first met him, in Rome, for the Africa 2009 program, which was really a very successful program, and has taught heritage management at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. And he's going to pre present to us on whether you can have both heritage conservation and development in, in an African context. So Weber, welcome to the stage, and I think uh, 10 to 15 minutes per presentation. Good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen. My apologies, I was supposed to have presented it some other day, but uh, we had another function. So I, at least uh, I'll try and do my best. Uh, this is a part of a presentation which I made almost a month ago in Cambridge. And I see some people who were in that uh, seminar and it was also on heritage and uh, sustainable development. Uh, this will be a shorter version, not, not the keynote which uh, I had. Um, my discussion is also something which uh, is prompted in many ways by what uh, tends to happen at World Heritage Committees uh, in relation to uh, state of conservation from Africa, where we have serious problems with development on these sides. And I know I'm going to say a lot of words, but if the thrust of all, what all I'm saying is that we need, as heritage professionals, to be represented at the highest table so that when decisions are made, heritage is taken into consideration. The Turkana Lake uh, issue uh, could have been avoided if uh, probably early consultations were done. But as usual, there was uh, the opening groundbreaking ceremony with the president saying the, uh, this is going, what is going to happen two years later. World Heritage says, no, you can't do that. So the thrust is basically to say, can we perhaps try and think ahead and try and influence the decisions? It is also prompted by the fact that we were challenged as AWHF by the Africa Union. I know most of you know the European Union, but Africa has a similar organization which perhaps doesn't work as efficient as the European Union. But their challenge was they have what they are calling the Agenda 2063. And the challenge was how does heritage fit into this agenda, the Africa we want to see in the next 50 years? So that's why then uh, my presentation, uh, I start with uh, obvious things. I'm sure most of you know that Africa is not, uh, is not a country, although we always say that, or we always talk about Africa as if it's one country, but there are many countries. So whatever we say is general information. I've already mentioned the issue of the Agenda 2063, but one of the major issues is that even the issue of development, when it is being discussed in Africa, it is discussed, again, outside political decision makers, but not at the grassroots. So people rarely influence what development is going to happen in their areas. There is an assumption that what is, whatever is discussed at this high level will benefit the poor. And in most cases, it doesn't seem to happen. Uh, the poor remain poor. And as statistics show us, it looks like we're even, I mean, Africa is even going backwards uh, rather than developing in any way. And again, the other message which I, I'm trying to give is that these people, local communities, poor people, need also to be heard. 
And uh, I think uh, we started off on a very good note that even heritage needs to talk about uh, human rights and issues like that. It's not something which you know, only the educated have to talk about. Now, again, the statistics I'm giving are coming from the AU, uh, looking at Africa and what is going to be happening, uh, which means there's going to be a lot of development, most of it driven by uh, industrialization, uh, urbanization, and we're going to have, you know, uh, probably more than 70% uh, of the population living in urban areas. The issue is, what is that going to do to heritage? What new heritage, again, is going to be created in those places? There is a tendency, we always think that heritage is always in the past. I believe that heritage is in the present. And as we celebrate what we get from the past, we also create new heritage, which shall be celebrated in the future. It's not just uh, what has already happened. We need to create new heritage as we go on. There's one comment which has been said about Africa and disindustrialization. Unlike Asia, where the middle class seems to be growing, in Africa the middle class seems to be shrinking. It, it doesn't seem to grow. And some people have said that whereas in other parts of the world, uh, hunting has stopped, uh, as an economic activity in Africa, even though the African is moving into the urban area, the concept of hunting is still the same. There are no jobs. Uh, urbanization is coming, but there are no jobs, there are no industries, and, and, and so forth. And the population is basically forced to go into the so called informal sector. 90 in, in most African countries, more than 60% of young people are not employed. Uh, and it's growing. It, it's not something which, you know, again, it will have an impact on heritage. We need to be discussing these things at that level. The other thing which we know, which has already been uh, put up, there are these economic nodes which the AU is trying to promote. The current road coverage in Africa is 34%, if not less, I think. While the electricity access is 30%, those of you who have traveled in Africa, whether it's in South Africa, Cape Town, or Cairo, or Bujumbura, or where, you will find that you always lose, you, you, at times you don't get electricity for days. Again, industrialization is going to be driven by energy. And this is where Africa is going to be putting a lot of resources. What does that mean to heritage? Obviously, some heritage is going to be destroyed if we are not very careful. I just mentioned a few here of the projects, 10 of the projects. Some of them are what you might call green energy, uh, particularly the one in um, Rwanda. I'm just trying to see where it, where it is here. Uh, it's, it's mainly solar energy being developed. Uh, and also the Jasper Power Project number eight is also uh, wind energy de being developed in, in South Africa. But most of them, it's coal, it's dam building, it's construction, uh, which again affects heritage in a big way. I just thought this would be interesting, particularly after talking about electricity, you can see where the lights are and where darkness is. And Africa again, it's almost like a blip darkness, nothing there. So the, the questions are, do we live in darkness or do we develop and at the same time destroy our heritage? I think it doesn't mean that as far as I'm concerned. We can develop as well as make sure that heritage is preserved. Obviously, heritage, some heritage may be erased, but we should not do that deliberately. There will be the rewriting of the present as well as the future, if not of the past. But we need to make informed choices about our heritage and development. It's not a question of either or. I've already mentioned the issue of uh, urbanization. Again, something which is going to affect the continent. Climate change is real. Some of us believe that some of the conflicts we are seeing in Africa is due to competition for resources. 
which is actually coming from climate change. So how does heritage now uh, contribute uh, to this? I think heritage can make sure that uh, develop, this development also plays a critical role in the identity of the communities, giving pride and making sure that you know, even jobs are created with heritage. I'll show you an example later of how this can be done. Again, these are the major threats to heritage, uh, which we all know from uh, the state of conservation reports, which we get every time. Mining, uh, the, one of the dams which is going to be created in DRC, they say it is going to dwarf the Three Gorges Dam in China. So again, if you think of it, how much heritage is going to be destroyed if we actually don't get ourselves involved? We have known about this for almost 10 years, but I don't know of any heritage professional who is engaged with, at the government level or at AU level. We will wait until they start constructing, then we will then pass a resolution to say, this site is going to go in danger because they've started building this. But when the planning is being done, we seem to be silent. We seem not to be at the table which is supposed to make decisions. This is a map which we have, I think, for the past few years, we've tried to uh, uh, distribute it. It shows potential mining areas, and it, it affects almost all the heritage sites which are in Africa. Uh, and if we're not very careful, remember the mining companies have got money. They can bribe governments. By the time you, you know, finish World Heritage Committee, something is already happening and you can't stop it. Uh, again, I want to emphasize we need to start early. We have had lessons, but I'm not so sure we have learned anything from those lessons. I think the 1972 convention was influenced by the Nubian campaign uh, in the 1960s, where there was rescue of uh, archaeological uh, monuments uh, in the Nile. But again, project to 2010 with the Mer Merowi Dam, the same mistakes happen. We come to the table very late uh, when things we can no longer control. The sad situation, even with the Nam Nam Nubian campaign, is that the material which was rescued from the Nile is now rotting in the museum and we're just looking at it. We have not studied it. We have not done anything about conservation. We are just looking at it and saying, oh, OK, we have rescued it. At times, even our processes make governments doubt whether we are serious with our work, because at times we just forget uh, some of the things which we would have presented. The other challenge is, how can heritage contribute to social cohesion? We saw Veronga, I think, yesterday what is happening there, and this picture actually comes from there. We also know about uh, uh, Timbuktu uh, and things like that. Again, when you look at these examples, and this was a big challenge for the AU because they said, we said, you know, heritage can contribute to social cohesion. And their answer was, in actual fact, we see the contrary. Look at Timbuktu. What is happening there? Isn't heritage causing the conflict. Uh, look at DRC. Again, we are waiting for somebody to show these politicians that heritage uh, plays a part in social cohesion. The challenge is how do we use heritage to silence the so many guns we find in Africa, which, by the way, at times are brought by the same companies who are doing mining and uh, things uh, like that, which in the end destroy heritage. I mentioned this the other day that think of any major world heritage sites on the African continent. You will notice that the, it is surrounded by poverty. Ngorongoro, Serengeti, uh, Gorea Island, there is no prosperity of, of any kind around these world heritage sites. So one of the things which we have to play a part in is to make sure that communities around these places, they get something out of uh, the sites. The argument with, I don't know, some of you might know about Mapungube, 
a company which is going to do mining says, I'm going to create 30,000 jobs here in the next two years, right? Then we say, no, no, heritage in the long run will create some jobs. But in the past, we have not demonstrated that it has done so. So how do we then argue that it will create jobs in the future? My point, I think, from the big word go is, I think we have to be much more proactive. I don't think that heritage and development are different sides of the same. I mean, they are, they are opposed to, to each other. Of course, there are many challenges which uh, Africa has. Uh, institutions are very weak. Uh, we can again see it even with nomination dossiers, the way they are hurriedly put together and, you know, and so forth. There is lack of skills. But then I think with World Heritage, I thought this was all about collaboration. This is about helping each other. These sites become uh, global sites. And therefore, there is need to perhaps even help uh, in developing the skills. Let me just end by summarizing some of the things which I'm trying to say. Definitely, Africa needs to develop. It will need infrastructure to achieve its, its uh, goal of uh, Agenda 2063. But heritage has got to be part of it. Heritage should be at the table where the AU is making decisions with uh, heads, of state, heads of states. It's not something which is going to be relegated to departments of uh, culture and pro probably the museum and say, OK, we'll see it next year, but not now. I think we need to make sure that we get to that high table. I also think that heritage can help in creating dialogue between heritage professionals and government, or decision makers, if you want to uh, call them that. But also create dialogue with communities. I think it sounds very difficult, like what uh, I quote there from Nelson Mandela, who says, it always seems impossible until it's done. Heritage in Africa is lagging behind uh, in terms of being at the table where issues of development are being discussed. We have had this year, uh, at least if I count this one, three heritage and development seminars, all of them in Europe, nothing in Africa. There's another one coming in Stanford where they're inviting us to go there, right? But in Africa, nobody is hearing this word. All they hear is now when the committee sends letters to say, hey, you are threatening this site. I thank you.